And so please welcome from the University of Helsinki, we have uh, Petri Ulikowski, uh, who is a professor of science and technology studies. Uh, and he will be speaking to us about why anticipating the impact is so difficult. Uh, and then we will have a, a presentation from Professor uh, Gazulo Soy, uh, who's uh, a professor of, of sustainable design at Aalto University. And she will talk to us about ways to think about impact in sustainability innovation. Uh, but bef just before we get that started to kind of uh, and, and, and give the floor to our first speaker, uh, I'd just like to mention that um, we have topics that are very interconnected. So we will proceed with one presentation after another without a Q&A. The Q&A will come towards the very end. We have reserved a lot of time for that. So uh, there's plenty of opportunities to ask your questions. You can either type them into the chat box function. Please indicate for whom that question is. Uh, or then uh, there will be a possibility to, to ask that live uh, uh, once we are done with the uh, presentations. And on that note, uh, without further ado, thank you very much everyone for joining us. And I would like to introduce our first speaker. So Petri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so let's see whether we can get, get this to work. So uh, we are basically demonstrating one of the key issues with the uh, with the uh, uh, technology, which is the interoperability. So can you see now my uh, yes. presentation? Okay, good. So I, I won't use the presentation mode. I will just change the slides. So uh, what I'm going to present to you is kind of a social scientist uh, uh, take on on uh, difficulties of of anticipating impact. So I'm trying to kind of uh, figure out. Uh, in half an hour, a couple of key reasons why uh, anticipating impact is so difficult from the social science uh, point of view. I, I will start with the, with the kind of a boogeyman for the historians of technology and, and, and social, social scientists studying technology. This is the idea of technological determinism. It is the idea that, that uh, technology would be some kind of independent engine of social change, meaning that, that uh, that, that it's not explainable by other things, and it's some kind of an engine motor, uh, or it has some kind of laws of its own, and also that it's impossible to influence it. And, and of course, this is not uh, very, very few people would state this as a kind of bold statement. Uh, but this is quite often kind of intuitive assumption, because it's actually quite tricky to kind of figure out what kind of things, what kind of processes are involved influencing the development of, of technology. And, and, and what, what the social scientists and historians have been doing, are, 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 they have tried to kind of figure out what, are, what kind of things uh, uh, are involved in this process. And, and, and then I'm going to give you kind of a kind of brief overview of kind of key ideas. So rather than thinking about technological determinism, I think it's better to talk about the technological mediation, meaning that social change, technological change is technologically mediated. So rather than kind of uh, getting stuck with this illusion of uh, unavailable necessity, which is behind this idea of technological determinism, you look back in the past that it seems that everything kind of uh, happened as it uh, should have happened, and, and then you can see how the kind of uh, our current technologies are kind of uh, clearly better than the alternatives that we had in the past. But if we kind of change the perspective and look from the point of view of kind of past, then it seems that there are a lot of contingency, a lot of choices to make for the different parties, and all these technologies are embedded in, 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 in society. So, so there are a lot of contingency choices. This doesn't mean that we have had some kind of collective decision making or, or decision makers about direction of technology. But we have been, as humans, as organizations, we have been doing uh, choices. And of course, and this is the, probably the most important concept in social sciences, unintended consequences of action. So, so, so we make choices and those choices have consequences and we quite often cannot anticipate what those are. But point is that uh, social change, technology is important for social change, but it's kind of uh, change is mediated by technology. So we can kind of reasonably think about what kind of a social uh, uh, motives, drives, mechanisms and so on are behind all of technological change. So technology is not unexplainable. So how to uh, get a grasp of, of this idea? So uh, I think a key idea is to think about technology, not as separate thing from the society, 
and as kind of social technological systems, kind of hybrids. So you have a technologies embedded in other technologies, but also embedded among humans and social institutions. And I would like to highlight the importance of social institutions because when we're talking about humans, we kind of tend to think about only about humans as a, as users and so on or individuals. But it's crucially important to understand that uh, all these kind of a, uh, uh, regulation, uh, conventions, rules, basically social institutions are crucial part of the kind of infrastructure that directs the evolution of technologies. And actually, when you're thinking about uh, institutions, it's useful to think them as, as kind of a specific source of their social technologies, in the sense that they are man-made, human-made, artific uh, basis that can be changed and can be built but they have the same kind of kind of properties as technologies like path dependence and so on. Of course, when thinking about the social technology systems, the humans are kind of a kind of crucial elements. On the other hand, they are flexible in a sense that all our technologies are based on the idea that people adapt to them. So, so they learn new things, they modify their behaviors and so on in order to make them work or uh, not work. So, so, so it's kind of human behavior is, is flexible. Our technologies haven't been thus far very flexible. Uh, so humans been, have been, been kind of doing the uh, adaptive part. But of course, humans are also fickle in, in a sense that, that we might not like things and it's quite often unpredictable what kind of things we don't like and how we will react to things. So things, for example, how, how we think about uh, art. Now we have now, uh, Kind of a cool technologies for creating artificial art that seems to be technically better than human made and it's extremely difficult to anticipate how we are going to think about this in the future is this going to be in the future because ai art becomes so easy is it so that we are going to value kind of a, a kind of a messy and incompetent humanly made art for example so but this is open-ended thing and I think this is quite important that we keep in the humans in the picture. Again, maybe my examples are from AI because of my, my current research projects. But I think it's kind of worrisome that when social scientists and journalists are talking about impact of AI in society, they are talking about algorithms and AI doing things rather than people building machine learning models and so on. So they are taking out the humans from the picture. And then I think this is, this is a kind of a effect of kind of a mystifying what happens with these technologies. I, I don't want to go to the uh, different elements of these, these hybrid systems. I just want to point out that apart from the technologies, we have all these social institutions, legislation, standards, conventions, commercial agreements. We have different kinds of agents, companies, organizations, individuals, and these, people, these agents have different roles, users, producers, sellers, and so on. And I think the basic difficulty, of course, understanding this whole is to taking all this into account. Second idea, which is I think is quite important, is that technologies are never finished. In a sense that 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 when you are producing a technology, they are, uh, the users are going to adapt uh, the, the technology to their own purposes. So scientists are talking about domestication of technologies compared to the domestication of, of animals in a sense that we modify them, we adapt them to our own purposes, we might invent novel uses and selective disregard features. And, and this is kind of a key element of all technology. So it's not enough to kind of fixate on the original plans of the innovators or technology developers or the ready-made uh, product and then criticize people for not using them in them right. We have to kind of figure out how they are incorporated people's activities. Of course, this gives the opportunity for the idea of co-creation, which is kind of a possibility of feedback from users uh, and people impacted from by technologies, uh, back, back to technologies. And this is kind of, a, I think, a key thing in developing kind of a socially sustainable uh, technologies. But point is that, that this domestication, adaptation, novel uses also make very difficult to anticipate uh, uh, how technology will develop. We never know what kind of a new uses people can find out uh, for our technologies. Next key thing is that is the idea of differential impact. 
So quite often when we, when we talk about technology, we kind of beautifully talk about humanity or, or nation as collective, uh, as a decision makers and agents. But but uh, humanity isn't a subject. In fact, we have the uh, reality where some people are making decisions and other, other people are impacted by these uh, decisions. And I think with technologies, we should always remember this. Uh, also remember that people have different goals, values and stakes. So they are differently affected. So no matter what technology you look in the past. You have always different groups with different goals uh, and interests, and they want to push the technology to different directions. So this, so, so even if you look at the history of bicycle, which now seems kind of a very harmless uh, uh, technology nowadays, in, in early, early years, these were highly kind of contested and people have very different ideas about what, what is the purpose of uh, bicycles and how they you should be regulated and so on. So, so paying attention to differences between groups. Uh, 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 and these differences can be multiple. The uh, differences in how much and in which way people are, can participate in decision making, or are they just people who are uh, influenced? Um, costs and benefits are, for, are different for different peoples. And of course, if you think about the technologies, the availability and quality of technology quality of available technology varies with people. And I think all these needs to be taken into account when we are thinking about technologies and the impact in the society. And, and of course, also the ability to avoid and influence the consequences of the uses of technology are, are quite different. And, and for example, if you think about health technologies, uh, and, uh, and I think kind of general social scientific finding is that usually is the educated, uh, middle class people who can best utilize any improvement uh, on health if it's for voluntary. And, and of course, it's nice to have, nice to provide people means to improve their health. But I think in the big picture, we should also think about whether there's kind of systematic differences in how people can utilize these, these, uh, these health services, treatments and, and, and uh, other things. Uh, from the differential impact, we can okay, get the, also the idea that technology is not neutral. So although technology itself doesn't include values and, and so on, I would like at least claim, but when you use technology uh, in use in society, it can make a difference. It can create and amplify inequalities, but it, it can also reduce or remove in, in inequalities. It can empower people or, 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 or take away their ability to influence things. But the key thing here again is that this never happens alone. We should pay attention to the institutions, kind of institutional framework within which these technologies are working. So, for example, legal regulation. And, and quite often this requires uh, kind of institutional innovations, new forms of regulation, new ways of conducting things. And of course, the regulation doesn't have to always be kind of a uh, nation states or uh, uh, setting laws, it can be conventions and, and so on, but in any way we need new practices. Uh, and, and, and sometimes this, uh, uh, this need for, for, for a new institution is only recognized afterwards. Think about, for example, now there's a lot of discussion about CTP and, and uh, these lang language models, and people are worried what kind of impact they have on society. People are the companies are, uh, are competing how fast they can put these products out and, and then they at the same time they, they are uh, uh, getting out uh, all kinds of ethics uh, uh, people who have been working in ethics bodies and so on and and, and uh, so, so people are really worried about what kind of impact this has and of course there's currently no way of illegally regulating this but this is kind of a kind of a hold back of the of the uh, of the older uh, history. So we have a very different history of regulating software and let's say uh, uh, medicine or, or uh, uh, automobiles. For the two latter, you have to have approval and it's highly regulated before you can, uh, uh, for example, launch new uh, medicines or new treatments. But with the, with the software, we are kind of still stuck in the past where software is quite kind of meaningful, meaningless things that 
one could distribute and then let the kind of population stick. But of course, currently that is not, no longer working, and we are facing the challenge of uh, institutional uh, innovation. And this links to the idea of a path dependence. So, so uh, this example of legal regulation of uh, software, I think, is a kind of example of path dependence. When the software uh, uh, industry started, uh, it was possible to take the other way around. But then once uh, it gets, get, get, uh, things get institutionalized and, and, and then commercial practices and industrial practices got on, it became increasingly difficult to change. And now we are kind of facing the situation that we have to make a change, but that requires a lot of rethinking of the kind of institutional guidelines for the, for the development of, of these technologies. Uh, yes, I, I observe that I'm speaking much faster than I as anticipated, but maybe that leaves us more time to speak. So this is kind of a, my final kind of point. Hey, take home message. This is about the role of trust. So, so uh, uh, when you're thinking about a uh, question, do we trust in science and technologies? This is kind of a, a quite typical question in, in, in tech questionnaires and so on, and then people give varying answers. But I, it's important to think about what does it mean to trust science and technologies? Does it mean that we trust scientists and engineers, that we, they are well-meaning, and that they are competent? Does it mean that we trust government and its ability to regulate what happens? Or uh, does it mean that we trust in the private companies involved in a specific area of technology? Uh, does it mean that we trust our, our fellow citizens? And think about, for example, this example of GMO uh, 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 foods. Uh, so, so, so clearly, uh, uh, people have issues of trust uh, and they are not very kind of good in articulating whom they are not trusting. But I think it's a key thing that we have to have trust in the whole chain, because basically people opposing these foods is partly kind of expressing their uh, uh, lack of trust. Some parts of this chain that includes the science, government, companies, and other uses of this technology. And and the, and then the, and they might distrust the competence of these parties or their motivations, and and and, and I think this is a key thing to keep in mind when launching new uh, technologies, uh, being open about the uh, limitation of the technology, and 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 and, and utilizing other means to communicating and kind of expressing uh, people what we are doing, what our goals so that they can actually uh, uh, have a trustful relation to us. And trust is not just kind of belief that we want to be people to have. I think we just think about it in terms of the, uh, that, that people should be justified in trusting us. So it should be fact about us rather than just their belief that they trust us. Uh, and then if you think about, for example, this uh, GMO example again, people have expressed a lot of crazy ideas about why GMO food would be dangerous and so on. I think uh, there are good case to be made that that uh, in these cases, when people are in, in the questionnaire, when they are interviewed, they are very bad in articulating the proper reasons for their distrust. So they kind of come up with uh, kind of a, a, a plausible sounding uh, a, a explanations, which which somebody might call hallucinating. Uh, um, but but point is that we shouldn't take their expressions as face value and think, okay, these people just don't know what they are talking about. I think we should take seriously the expression of distrust and then kind of figure out whether they actually have just wrong beliefs or do they have a, a, or are they actually expressing some sort of a distrust in this chain from the science to government and the companies and so on. And of course, uh, trust is uh, slow to build and easy to lose. For example, in Finland, quite often we hear that Finns are trusty, and that's why we should do all kinds of experiments, for example, Finnish, with Finnish data. But I think that's a bit risky because it doesn't take that many uh, uh, mistaken uses or, or misuses of data, and people lose this trust. And then this resource is, is, is uh, lost for a very long time. I think this is a good point. Finnish 
And, and thank you. We can continue on these themes on, on the discussion. But before that, uh, we will have a ideals uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petri. Uh, very, very good note to, 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 to and message to land on uh, towards the end. Idil, if the floor is yours. Thank you. I am uh, going to share my screen along with the uh, desires and whims of uh, um, teams. So it's happening. It's happening. Yes, getting there. Um, now I think we are there. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Uh, so I'm going to start my timer uh, because I don't want to talk uh, more than my fair share. And um, I'm actually much more interested in uh, in the discussion that we're going to have after my talk than my own talk. Um, so I I'm Idil Gazi and I'm professor of sustainable design. Um, I'm a sustainability scientist and a design researcher, and I'm going to <clears throat> talk a little bit about ways to think about impact in uh, sustainability innovation. Uh, in parenthesis, responsible sustainability innovation, because um, there are also myriad ways of uh, of doing sustainability innovation irresponsibly. Um, so, moving, yes. So, um, I decided <clears throat> to start with the kind of core central question of IBEX. Um, essentially, um, uh, as designers, one of the first things that we do is we look at the brief and then we start to kind of unpack that. Uh, it's it's part of both analysis, but also creatively interpreting the brief. So <clears throat> old habits don't go away. So I thought hmm, some playful framing uh, could actually be interesting uh, for the purposes of, of my talk. So um, how do we develop technology and whole systems that maximize positive impacts while minimizing harm? We have seen this also at the very beginning of today's uh, today's session uh, shared in Simon's um, presentation. So this is this is the question that we have, the kind of high level question that we have at hand. And then I, I thought, OK, what is really kind of what needs, what is begging attention for, you know, uh, further exploration? And I have underlined these three kind of parts, technology and whole systems, maximizing positive impacts, minimizing um, harm. Um, so first thing I thought was, OK, uh, I, I'm a, as a sustainability scientist, I'm fairly uh, uh, I think well trained about systems theories, um, but uh, you know I, I don't really understand when there is a reference to whole systems. Uh, are we talking about an apple as a whole system, or the entire universe, or anything in between? So I was like, okay, hmm, this needs to be unpacked. And though as I was doing this tinkering, I realized that there is this technology and whole systems that kind of. Um, made me realize this assumption that we are going to develop technology no matter what and all systems. Um, and I actually really want to, to open space for questioning. I know I am also trained as an engineer, uh, so I know that technology development can feel like a raison d'etre of uh, existence. Um, but I moved to design because actually that resonated with me a little bit more uh, rather than, you know, thinking about, OK, we're going to develop technology. We were more thinking about, OK, what is the need here? What's the human need? Uh, what does the society actually, you know, what kind of function uh, does, the, uh, does the society uh, require in this particular context? So I would like to, uh, as much as I'm aware that, <laughs> that I'm doing this talk, in VTT, I still would like to start from the fundamentals. So is there a need for technology innovation? Um, or is it a different kind of innovation that is needed? Because one, uh, when we talk about systemic innovation, um, essentially, uh, or uh, first of all, I mean, whole systems include technology uh, anyway. 
uh, because it is whole. You know, even if it is uh, not yet well defined, of course, a whole system would include technology. However, um, does that really, you know, necessitate, necessitate um, technology development? Because uh, in certain cases, in responsible sustainability innovation, what is needed in developing these whole systems is actually reconfiguring, you know, how the system components are organized. So it's not not necessarily about developing new technologies, but it's actually creatively reorganizing what is existing already um, so that the whole system functions in the way that we want it to function. So I think this is a very legitimate question. Is there a need for technology innovation to start with? And this is a contextual question, of course, needs to be uh, asked and answered in the context of, of, um, of the projects. Um, and when it comes to, of course, the type of innovation, well, um, even if in cases where there is a need for technology development, whole systems uh, change require other kinds of innovations as well, such as social, organizational and institutional. So then, uh, you know, how, how can we think about those different types of innovations uh, while we are focusing on our IBEX projects, uh, which, you know, eventually may be about technology development. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yes. So, um, but of course, then comes kind of unpacking uh, what constitutes positive. Positive is a very, very, uh, like, nondescript <laughs> term, and it's begging for, you know, begging for uh, clarification same for of course uh, harm uh, and uh, and then i would like to kind of bring this into the context of maybe power uh, and uh, you know distribution of these effects across society so positive for who who are we actually talking about that we would like to maximize positive impacts for and also, of course, minimizing uh, harm for who exactly? Um, and and then there are these two more layers. Uh, there are you know more kind of complex systemic layers that we need to keep in mind. And at least um, even if we're not going to <clears throat> focus our work on them, we really need to keep in mind that these are relevant to our work. So in which spatial context and temporal frames are we actually talking about developing whole systems, maximizing positive impacts and minimizing harm? And who is asking and answering these questions? Uh, and, you know, what is the position of, of that who in this whole, um, in this whole uh, uh, endeavor? Uh, it, I'm assuming it's us. I don't know who us is. Um, but what is our positionality and what does that mean? Uh, this kind of reflexivity, I think, is also very important while thinking about impact in the short term and the long term and also in the micro and macro levels uh, of our projects. So um, have all stakeholders to be impacted, being included to frame and evaluate impact. This may not necessarily be practically possible in all cases, but I think thinking about this while we think about, you know, how we are going to uh, evaluate impact uh, is, is really important. Uh, and always keep in mind that there are stakeholders who are voiceless and cannot really be kind of included, you know, in framing and evaluating impact, such as future generations and more than humans. And what are we going to do about them? So as a sustainability scientist, uh, of course, when I think about positive impact uh, and harm, uh, I frame it in the complex of sustainability, resilience and justice. Um, so, uh, well, we need to uh, reduce impact and that's about mitigation and that's kind of, you know, about minimizing harm to a large extent. Um, and then adapting to already locked in impact uh, is both about kind of maximizing the available positive impact uh, while also minimizing harm. And then justice is doing all of this ethically, um, but also with a long-term uh, orientation. 
So then, um, how do we consider the complexities of the polycrisis moment we are in when thinking about impact? Uh, because it may not actually be as simple as maximize positive impact, minimize harm, because we're not quite able to frame uh, what is actually positive and what is, uh, you know, uh, harm uh, precisely and also over the kind of temporal frames that are applicable to our projects. And then how do we bear an account for the uncertainties we're facing uh, in thinking about and creating impact? Very kind of closely connected to the previous question because uncertainty and complexity go hand in hand. And then I was thinking about, OK, whole systems, whole systems, what do they consist of? Um, and I wanted to bring forth uh, the kind of, um, you know, the models of uh, uh, whole systems uh, that relate to sustainability. And I, I wanted to kind of uh, um, also show the two um, fundamental models, weak sustainability, strong sustainability, and uh, and kind of issue a warning that most of the time um, we work with, we operate with without necessarily consciously knowing, and we also evaluate impact uh, uh, using weak sustainability model, which assumes that um, that these values in these systems are kind of um, comparable and you know uh, kind of replaceable with one another and most of the time at the expense of environment and society because we're very you know economic uh, um, kind of we're very focused on on um, the, the the health and well-being of our uh, neoliberal economic system um, whereas uh, in reality there are irreversible kind of hierarchies and interdependencies between these systems and economic systems are societal, you know, social constructs. We make them, uh, whereas uh, biosphere, uh, we unfortunately, in a very, very vulnerable way, totally depend on. So then the questions I kind of wanted to put forward uh, was how do we model the systems we will have an impact on and how do we model our systemic impact? considering uh, strong sustainability um, as our kind of more, uh, you know, base model of understanding um, sustainability. Whoops. Then comes uh, the uh, most amazing traditional and still dominant super linear um, uh, impact assessment model, um, which I, I, I remember uh, when I maybe started university, this is uh, year 1995. Um, we were using these graphics and it's like, hey, uh, we're in 2023 now. Uh, why am I still looking at this? Uh, exactly uh, the same graphic of inputs, processes, outputs, outcome, impact, and everything is linear and progressive, of course. Um, uh, so I, I would like to uh, um, kind of, you know, of course, I, I, I'm aware that there is a, um, a quite uh, uh, in-depth understanding of the limitations of this kind of uh, impact assessment model. Um, but nonetheless, I, I really wanted to, you know, emphasize that this model is not working for, uh, for the complexities that we are dealing with when you know, our projects have numerous components across multiple dimensions of um, systems and uh, targeting more than one intervention point at a time, uh, et cetera. So um, I, I, I really would like to maybe encourage uh, development of, uh, you know, development of uh, how are we going to evaluate our impact with, um, with the feedbacks that are there uh, as well as, uh, you know, the different types of impact that we would like to maybe um, evaluate because there's not one type of impact, in my opinion, in this. You know, this project will, of course, um, have some outputs which will have some real life impacts. But is that the highest priority thing we should focus on? Uh, what are we going to learn uh, along the way? 
and actually how that learning can transform me as a professional, can transform my organization, can transform the world. So there are all these amazing, you know, complex layers of impact that we can uh, think about when we are uh, thinking about how um, how to kind of think about impact in relation or in the context of IBEX projects. And then I wanted to uh, do some um, uh, shameless self-promotion because why not? Uh, so this is a very high level evaluation criteria uh, for responsible sustainability innovation I developed uh, in my PhD. Um, uh, so I, according to uh, according to this model, uh, I thought that uh, strong sustainability, systems thinking, radical innovation, long term orientation and mindset change are quite important. Uh, but just opening up maybe a couple of things that may not necessarily be obvious. Radical innovation is not radical technological innovation, radical innovation at the systemic level. So radical uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, recombinations uh, of uh, assets that create a new system or, you know, new systems uh, that are radically different than what we have now. And long term orientation long -term again, orientation. is not about um, five years, three years, kind of 2050. Uh, people were looking at 2050 in 1990s when they were thinking about sustainable technology development. And that stuck. <laughs> so we're still looking at 2050 and 2050 is like tomorrow. Um, and I, I would like to remind us that, um, you know, sustainability is about the nominal lifespan of of uh, the operational kind of contexts that we are interested in the sustainability of. So as a human being, you know, lifetime expectancy wise, if I reach 75 years uh, of age, I will be considered as sustainable. Um, so it's very contextual, at least in, you know, when we think about the systems uh, understanding of sustainability rather than United Nations understanding of sustainable development goals. It's about nominal uh, lifespan. So this long term orientation should really be considering the, the nominal lifespans of entities, you know, we are looking at. So if it's a city, arguably our life, uh, our kind of long term or longest term should definitely not be 15 years, but a little bit longer than that. Uh, but if we are, you know, um, thinking about or looking at the sustainability of um, of maybe um, something less complex uh, and has proven to last uh, shorter than, you know, well-functioning cities, which actually last for thousands of years, we could actually shorten. And I think we can also have multiple time frames, you know, uh, to kind of uh, evaluate or think about impact in in relation to our projects. And mindset change is quite important and becoming very relevant. Uh, so um, mindset change kind of in a double loop way. So uh, it should change mindset internally, or you know, in, within the organization that is undertaking uh, innovation, but also the innovation itself should assist with changing, you know, mindsets in larger society. Uh, if you like this, uh, it's all yours, of course, um, but this um, also be complemented with uh, more sophisticated ways of um, thinking about systems and impact and kind of leverage points. And this is my last slide. I'm also a little bit early, so that's wonderful. We will have good time to discuss. So many, many of you um, who are sorry, who are working with systems and uh, systems theories will be totally familiar with what I'm showing here. For those um, <clears throat> who may not be familiar with this, this is a seminal work from Donella Meadows, um, uh, who was the lead author of Limits to Growth in 19 uh, in 1970s, but a prominent uh, systems scientist. She developed this kind of um, theoretical framework of leverage points to intervene in a system. Initially, there were nine points uh, and then it was expanded to 12. I think the numbers are a little bit, you know, arbitrary. I am sure there are also incrementally 
um, indefinite number of inter leverage points across. But anyhow, the, the very important kind of insight from recent research in sustainable science had been that uh, both policy and research have been focusing on shallow leverage points, uh, whereas the society needs to transform, um, you know, kind of uh, much more radically than can be achieved through intervening shallow leverage points, um, and in a in a kind of uh, short uh, short period of time, that transformation, at least some of it, could you know should uh, should happen. Um, but then it's also very normal that we are focusing on shallow leverage points because they are, you know, easier and more concrete. Um, so then the question is, uh, you know, how can we engage uh, and and work with deep leverage points, uh, both in creating and assessing impact? Um, because, I mean, admittedly, not all of us, maybe not many of us will sit down and think about kind of direct interventions into mindsets and worldviews. Um, but uh, this is not a linear model. Many people read this as a linear model. This is not, there are feedback loops. So we can actually intervene at parameters level, but it might have the potential to, uh, you know, to, to influence leverage points at the deeper levels. So can we, can we have this kind of um, of um, leverage point thinking when we are, uh, you know, thinking about um, about our our impact uh, in in IBEX projects, but also in uh, broader uh, <laughs> professional lives? So um, I reached the end of my talk, and this is essentially what was prompted by the high level question of IBEX, and uh, I'm really you know, thankful because it gave me a lot of kind of stimulus to think about uh, impact in the context of responsible sustainability innovation. So uh, thank you very much. And I am now going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very, very, very much, Idil, for that uh, that uh, presentation and Petri also. Um, we have plenty of time uh, to have our discussions, which, which Idil was very, very um, excited already about. Uh, so uh, let's let's open the floor for questions and comments. Please raise your hand uh, and and then that would be the easiest way to ask a question. Mario Rica, go ahead. Hello. Good to see Professor Ulikoski here. We have met at Kuluttajatutkimuskeskus at the University of Helsinki. Um, I heard you mention practices, uh, mechanisms and routines a couple of times. I recognize this um, idea after having worked with uh, Professor Mika Pantar. Um, I would like to ask from you and perhaps also from Idil, uh, because this intrigues me, how do you um, how do you make up the tension between the routines and practices, and then this kind of a great paradigmatic change and innovation that, like, may come every ten years or twenty years or something like that? How do you, how do you um, how do you balance them? How do you explain them? What is your take on that? And not easy question. <laughs> um, so um, I, I didn't say anything specific about practices and and so on, but 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 clearly those are kind of routine things, and and most of the things that we are doing is kind of a build up upon kind of unreflexive practices and, and and routines and so on. And so when we are changing things, we have to think about how we changing things that we that, that we are doing and kind of readapt our, our routines. So so we cannot. Kind of a, it's like a, a, I think this is this is a, it's useful to think about a, a routines in the same way as we th th uh, think about building up skills. Think about learning to play something. When you first learn the the kind of a play guitar, you have a difficulty controlling your fingers. But then as your capabilities uh, uh, grow, you you begin start kind of thinking in terms like like a. a 
uh, 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 notes and 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 charts and so on. Uh, and then uh, as your skills develop, you can kind of deal with it at more abstract level. And then all these other things are more like automatic, and they adapt to your goals. And I think we should think about in this uh, this in the in the same sense that we have institutionalized practices, but then are we changed and uh, the, the, the incentives we set for ourselves, but also kind of rules, conventions, and then our practices adapt to those. But it requires kind of additional layer of, of reflection. So how this system should work. And when we go to kind of bigger questions, ideal was dealing with, that's even, even more important. And I think this is kind of a key challenge. We need some kind of a in, institutional innovations, how to do this. For example, thinking about kind of uh, developing sustainable technologies and this thing, thinking this uh, in a systemic way, uh, probably the best way of producing this kind of a thinking is not one or two year pr uh, projects, because that doesn't kind of uh, allow kind of build up. So we have to think about also how we organize it and how we kind of build up kind of some kind of a uh, 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 growth or accumulation in, in the process, but also criticism. So, so this is not a suggestion that we should make a research project eternal because that's not either a good idea either. But, but kind of rethinking how we are producing the relevant ideas and visions, and also, of course, not all institutional innovations will work. So, so that also requires kind of a experimental mindset in which way. We can actually make things work. I don't know whether that answered your question, but I, I, I at least tried to, uh, to read something. Uh, do you have ideal, uh, some uh, additional so, points? Or alas. Do you agree, disagree? Um, <laughs> Well, no, I, I I don't have a disagreement with you, Petri, at all, and and I also really empathise, uh, um, Maria Rica, with your question because, I mean, it's it's a sustainability scientist's life story, you know, feeling tiny, uh, and with really little leverage wherever you are. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're a professor or if you're an R and D of a company or etc. And dealing with this kind of large, complex long-term uh, systemic structural problem that started to bang on, you know, a hammer on it, on our heads. Um, well, the, the, for me, the first thing was to kind of um, avoid self-paralysis uh, because that's how I kind of got into, in a way, sustainability science. When I finished my master's degree in design and learned about sustainable design, I decided I'm not going to design anything, none whatsoever, because whatever I design has an impact, negative impact. Um, and as I learned about, of course, systems and how systems change, um, I, re I realized that we do, each of us do have leverage on a day to day basis, millions of times. Uh, I mean, of course, not millions, but indefinite you know, opportunities exist actually in our routines to intervene at institutional you know level changes for example i do this and i'm sure many professors do this every day uh, in our universities you know we do things that are part of our routine uh, and they're necessary for the kind of well functioning of the university but then can change um the institution or challenges the institution so when i realized that I actually embed a lot of inter, you know, interventions into my day-to-day -day routines. I also started to raise hands for, for certain tasks that I would have you know, leverage as an institutional activist or topics that were interesting for me to see change. Um, and this also you know, kind of scales up to my broader life and et cetera. Um, so, Years ago, I had this very heated discussion with, at the time, a full professor when I was a PhD student, talking about system innovation and big systemic change, and you know how to kind of how should companies behave and etc. Very prescriptive, and he said, "Well, I mean, you know, you change the system when you actually drop your car and hop on your bicycle and start to use bicycle as your mode of transport." And I had a very heated discussion because to me, that 
systemic change was tiny little, and I was interested to change the whole systems. Uh, but now I actually appreciate the fact that I do change the system because I am, you know, cycling. Um, so it's also changing the perspective of how we see our leverage and how we see our power as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a follow up question from Zeynep, uh, both Idil and Petri. Can you point to any concrete examples of intervening in deep leverage points in the context of technology innovation? Which actors are involved in implementing this type of intervention? Who would like to go tackle that? Well, I can try. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a very um, <laughs> misguided and misguiding uh, answer. But to start with, I really do not think that technology innovation does start, can start, or even should start with an ambition to intervene in the deep leverage points. Um, I think the other way round of that is if we are kind of interested at the deeper leverage points how can we think about technology innovation and you know strategize about technology innovation is a better way to think about that in my opinion um uh, because deep leverage points is you know they are uh they're not they're not tangible leverage points uh, but they're very powerful leverage points to reframe the shallower leverage points and how we work with them and how we, um, you know, how we, how we allow them or allow them to guide our technological innovation efforts. Um, and also, I have not witnessed any technology developing entity uh, going, you know, and thinking, oh, deep leverage points. Uh, how does this look like at deep leverage points? Um, I think there are different cultures also at operation there. Um, so this is not a direct answer to your question, uh, but I do think that we need to kind of turn it around and you know start with the deep, deep leverage points and then look at technology innovation through that lens and then think about, okay, how does this look like at the shallower, leverage points as technological innovation. OK, if I continue, of course, I'm not so much inside to the kind of leverage points, but I think if you think about, for example, environmental uh, uh, reaction, uh, uh, let's say climate change. So so the uh, solution doesn't that doesn't work is to kind of rely on that everybody changes their personal mindset and then as consumers do something. So, so these things require organized actions. We have social movements, states, and and things like that. And so, so it needs to be organized action. It cannot be just. And that's why I kind of kind of a little bit skeptical of mindset being at the bottom, because of course, in a certain sense, it's a deep because it kind of motivates how we how we think how the system should work and so on. But it also kind of a, might be quite shallow, like this kind of a consumer uh, mindset. Uh, but but then uh, other thing. Uh, uh, this is probably the kind of thing that you can plan, but think about, for example, open source software. I think that has kind of quite dramatically changed how software is done and and and, and uh, changed how the, the industry operates. And that's, of course, not that has not been kind of planned uh, action, but I think looking at how it can get implemented and how it transformed uh, the landscape of of, of, of of software. I think that is one kind of instructive example of how to have a kind of a, a deep uh, uh, impact on how do we develop technologies. Mm. Um, if I can add just a little bit of a you know further thought, I think it's not you know easy to talk about technology innovation. At the level, at deeper leverage points, but I can give a very concrete example on technological innovation that's essentially unfolding now. That is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, um, short termist and operating at shallow leverage points, and that's the push that's going uh, at the moment into diffusing 
uh, electrical cars. Um, of course, it's a very important transitionary you know, uh, solution, but on the other hand, I'm not really seeing the deployment uh, being strategic enough to lead to actually the the uh, much more you know um, uh, radical uh, uh, mobility system change that actually is needed in my opinion to address sustainability, land use, climate change um, problems uh, with you know with how how this uh, transitioning to electric cars is done is happening uh, in a way that is creating quite kind of, you know, long-term lock-ins and pathway dependencies, essentially, you know, all of this infrastructure is at the moment um, being developed, a lot of investments going into it. So, um, you know, I, I wonder how that would look like the, you know, the transitionary solution quality of uh, electrical cars, how that would look like if we were actually activating you know the whole spectrum of um leverage points very good point um other questions and comments to petri and idil tina go ahead yeah first thanks thanks a lot for a very very inspiring presentations <laughs> I found it found for myself at least a very useful for both both of you from your side. Well, um, I would like to a little bit to reflect about the the presentations for the existing situation in Finland and in and also globally, because we have now uh, experienced this uh, many type of uh, shocks. And I like very much what was mentioned by Petri that uh, the question of trust. And um, I'm just wondering that uh, when we are talking about these um, socio-technical changes uh, and, uh, and the, on the system level, uh, how you reflect uh, in the changes in uh, when you are talking about, of course, uh, the trust and then uh, about the shocks and uh, how these can uh, reflect uh, between each other. And then also for the EDL, uh, the question related this uh, leverage points. You mentioned that uh, the policymakers easily make this make these uh, thorough, uh, shallow uh, leverage points, which are easier to make. So um, if we are thinking about, for example, the existing situations when we are having this uh, governmental negotiations going on. <laughs> Any reflectors? <laughs> because that will have also huge impacts uh, for the coming years in, in Finland. Not the easy question, but maybe some ideas. Uh, I'm an immigrant, uh, so <laughs> the 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 you know I have zero power uh, uh, because I'm not eligible to vote. However, what is unfolding is going to impact me uh, quite significantly. So here you go, a thought on impact and intervention, uh, and that's all I I really have the energy to say about the elections and the government forming at the moment. Um, yeah, because it, it's my you know one of my anxiety points at the moment, uh, but. Mm. Uh, yes, I, I'll trust. Uh, so uh, I think that's kind of a key issue nowadays. So if you think about populist politics and so on, it is quite often described as, as a distrust in experts. And of course, uh, that's kind of a byproduct of the fact that we are more and more using experts. We have, haven't been relying, uh, we have never been relying as much as experts as nowadays. And of course, these quite often, uh, uh, when things are uh, thick, sticky uh, and difficult, then we kind of uh, tend to argue on the point of position of expertise. And, and I think we should think about in which, in which occasions we actually are kind of uh, appealing to facts and when we are appealing to kind of uh, values and other things. Because uh, on the long term, uh, if you always kind of uh, make uh, a rhetorical use of expertise, kind of overextending expertise, that's going to erode trust in expertise because then expertise starts to look 
uh, look, uh, uh, look, uh, look, uh, kind of a, somehow uh, corrupt or influenced by politics, and and then kind of uh, dissolves the trust. But also, of course, the problem is that most of the areas where we need expertise is kind of a policy regulation context where we have significant uncertainty and and kind of a alternative possibilities and not really clear pathways. And of course, that's kind of a so so this this trust in expertise somehow kind of a necessary systemic. A byproduct, but I think we should deal with that better. So we shouldn't just take for granted that that experts in at the state offices, the OIL or somewhere else, can just know or just set things. But this is extremely uh, tricky, tricky uh, thing. But I, I think we should uh, 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 think more about how to preserve kind of cognitive authority where uh, it is justified. But also not in terms of just people trusting us, believing that we are trustful, but actually being worth of that trust. I think that's a much more uh, a more demanding uh, task. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just a little bit uh, like uh, following my thoughts uh, because, for example, when we were having this COVID period, uh, EU made this kind of surveys that the, how much the policymakers are trusted between it, each like different EU countries and and it was recognized that uh, at least in Finland the trust for the policymakers during that time was very very high but uh, I think think that there's also very uh, like um, cultural differences are very high as well between these kind of uh, trust things <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah this is something that we need to look at I think more carefully. Yeah, thank you. I I also would like to add uh, because I'm kind of triggered as a transdisciplinary researcher and who thinks about what is legitimate expertise in a given context quite a lot. Uh, you know, this term expert is used quite vaguely, uh, even by you know academics themselves. So I think there's also a need for. Um, you know, discussing who is a legitimate expert to kind of, you know, uh, um, provide trustworthy expertise in X, Y, Z contexts. Um, yeah, I, I think that's also from a democracy point of view, it's very, very important. Thank you, Idil um, and Petri. Um, we have a question uh, just uh, from Max. Before we go to Katri, I see your hand up. Uh, uh, Max wrote, I see some changes in examples research uh, um, uh, programs over the last years in including impact assessment in the project requirements from LCAs to interdisciplinary research and so on. Would you be in favor that impact assessment should be part of any applied research project or do you think this will hamper tech innovations or do you see any other ways to change the mindset in applied research to more consider the impacts of tech development and work interdisciplinary on solutions which solve the challenges we face? And Max open his camera so so maybe turn on his camera maybe you want to you want to take it over yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that that's it. Basically, uh, I've been working sustainability research uh, in the last 15 years. I don't see those changes, but I don't think it's enough yet in a way. So how, how would you describe that over the, the, the history, but also what, what the future needs, basically? Is, is the question... Do you understand so, the question? The question is a bit tricky in the sense that I don't exactly know what how it has been implemented, but but based on on my kind of a kind of a probably analytical thinking uh, or, or case, it's it's kind of a kind of a two ways. So so if you make it obligatory and kind of a shallow part of every project, that might not be very productive. Uh, but then leaving it. But on the other hand, I think it's kind of a good idea to think in which ways. We could involve in, in in already in a planning uh, 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 stage of the project that people think about the impact and kind of think how it could be assessed. Uh, so 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 I, I think it should should be incorporated. But how to do it? Because some it might become just empty ritual, 
And then it's not very useful. It might be even harmful because then people think that, okay, we have taken care of this. <laughs> no, no reason to think about it anymore. Uh, but, 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 but then how impact people? So this is again kind of an issue of uh, actual uh, social innovation, which ways to actually do it. But, but, but it should be, I, I think, uh, it, inside projects from the planning period. But, uh, but, but then how to implement it and kind of uh, enforce it into very different kinds of projects. I don't have any kind of a ready solutions there. Thanks. Um, I'm, I mean, <laughs> interesting that your question almost uh, situates, you know, life cycle assessments and impact of interdisciplinary research or impact of interdisciplinarity as comparable. But I think they serve for completely different uh, purposes. Um, so I can't answer, you know, the general question of is impact assessment uh, should, you know, it should be part of applied research because what kind of impact assessment are we talking about? I believe if, uh, I mean, this, I guess there's no way to say yes or no, you know, as an answer to this question. Again, very contextual, um, but. Um, um, I, I mean, I do not think and I don't think there is evidence, strong evidence that suggests that interdisciplinarity hampers technological innovation. Uh, it might kind of, you know, uh, result in development of technologies uh, in different kind of directions. Uh, and also, um, I'm not really sure uh, what is you know, what does hampering technological innovation mean? Because I really do not come from a position of technological development is a raison d'etre of, you know, interdisciplinary work. Um, sometimes interdisciplinary work is necessary to establish what kind of technologies we need or what kind of technologies we should bring together. Um, I am personally frustrated that now there is this almost all EU funding, almost all funding uh, is, you know, pushing uh, towards executionist collabor collaboration idea um, and, and people are forced to collaborate um, in the long run, whether this is, uh, you know, good or bad for the society. I think uh, it can, it, the evaluation of this can come down the track. Um, but I understand why this is happening, because we are going through a crisis moment. I'm not sure if this is, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if mandating all research, you know, is going to do something in real life and is going to be collaboratory. I'm not sure about that, but I guess we will see, you know, how this program uh, in, will, will kind of um, influence the society or will, what kind of an impact it will have on our society as it is now down the track. Uh, so I'm also waiting in excitement, um, maybe 25 years from now, we will turn back and reflect. Yeah, that was good. No, that wasn't good. Thank you. <laughs> um, Patrick, would you like to continue? Uh, on this uh, or hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, Yes, uh, I would kind of like to continue from the Max uh, question in a way when we talk about the uh, the impact and uh, kind of the impact to, to people, society, so socio technical systems. Uh, we kind of um, all agree that uh, policy is needed to kind of um, uh, to steer the collective uh, activity into a kind of like better uh, direction. But then the, the kind of the other side of the coin is that kind of like when we look um, what is the kind of the, the role of, of technology de developers, it is to kind of, you know, create innovations as our business, so to say. So, so um, and it, it is fast. The, the technological development currently, it is happening fast. And uh, if we then look at the, for example, the policy development, it is much slower and the kind of the institutional change that is, is happening, it is much slower. So, so how do you see that how we could kind of support the 
the kind of the motivation and the capabilities inside the, the tech community and the science community as ourselves to kind of, you know, take the responsible role of, of trying to anticipate and understand the impact what we are generating to the society that that is there something we could do, you know, differently, for example, uh, involve uh, like people from social sciences or or humanities in order to understand already when we develop that what type of you know change this might have in the society so so how to kind of like support the positive force of the developers in doing good and not only seeing the solution as kind of like having more you know policies that are directing and kind of like that that because that is not motivating often for people to you know to de develop something so a little bit of reflection on this how do you see the kind of like bottom up role and how we could do what differently or better in order to generate the kind of positive impact thank you uh, if I could start a uh, couple of points come to my mind. First, first is that I think there's a kind of a, uh, a huge need in public debate for kind of technological expertise in a sense that you have people who actually know the technologies, who develop them, explaining how they how they work. So I have I've been dealing with this AI, and I, I think that's an area where where most of the people's ideas, what these new systems can do and how they work, are based on journalistic uh, sources. Uh, kind of mm -hmm. third hand sources, so, uh, sources and, and very few people are uh, kind of presenting independent critical thoughts on okay, what could actually uh, be done with these things. So we need kind of expertise, but of course, this is from the point of view of technology developers, kind of a tricky in a sense that you shouldn't be talking about your own technologies because then it's quite easily kind of a, you are ruining your uh, position because you might be selling your stuff. So, so so, so this means that we need a technological experts who have kind of wide enough expertise who can communicate understandably about kind of outside their own specialization and kind of, uh, kind of input. So they, have to, they don't have to be the top experts, uh, top developers in that specific technology that they are discussing, but have a kind of general understanding, providing conceptual tools for people to understanding what, what, what this technology is about, what, what kind of consequences it might have, and so on. Uh, the other thing is the, the involvement of, of human, uh, uh, people from humanities and social sciences in the technology process. I think that's a basically good idea, but I think that's quite actually quite tricky to, to, to realize because most of the, these things are happening in the project time, people are with the temporary employment and so on. And, and, and then in these interdisciplinary projects, you have to find kind of a mutually uh, uh, agreeable uh, joint products that would be kind of a good enough from all parties. And that's quite often quite uh, quite difficult. And, and it's kind of a, a long learning process to kind of uh, learn what you can do together in a way that is kind of a both intellectually satisfactory for both parties, but also kind of produces something that that uh, allows a kind of a intellectual, uh, kind of, uh, let's say, professional uh, reproduction of, of the participants. So, so uh, this is something that we need to think about how to do it and how to develop this, this kind of capabilities, because it's not obvious for either parties, which is the best way of involving social scientists, for example, in, in, in the technology projects. Um, Simon, can I respond or? Absolutely, please go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you have a hand, sorry. Um, well, my response to this is uh, not based on uh, um, empirical research, but based on <laughs> doing research in such settings uh, where, um, you know, the focus is actually systemic change of some sort in, in real life. Um, well, I guess the short answer, should there be uh, people from humanities and social scientists? Absolutely. Uh, because um, the kind of critical perspectives, you know, about technology development uh, comes from uh, from from there uh, more often than um, 
than uh, you know technology developers themselves. For example, uh, interestingly enough, we have um, philosophy of science, philosophy of technology, but we don't have philosophy of engineering. Uh, that always has been something quite interesting for me as an engineering student at the time, because I did not have this you know self-reflection tools about my kind of professional practice area. Um, but in practice, of course, it comes down to because I mean, social science is huge. So who do we bring together expertise wise and uh, makes a lot of difference. But also, who do we bring together personality wise and alignment wise? Also, I think um, uh, is very important because interdisciplinary collaboration and being productive in that environment, because that environment is high tension environment. Uh, essentially, um, you know, on one hand, there is this kind of entity uh, I'm characterizing now, but designers, engineers, we just we just want to jump in and make something and solve these problems that we see in the world. Uh, and, you know, very, very kind of um, execution oriented, um, whereas Social science, humanities is a bit more like, hang on a minute, let's look at this, let's analyze, let's critically reflect, let's look at the layers, um, you know, and dimensions and et cetera. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, what kind of expertise are going to be put together in the context of a project and for which purpose? Uh, I think, you know, the devil is in the detail, um, but absolutely, I think any technology developing entity project uh, person should be matched with um, relevant uh, social science and humanities, uh, you know, depth and expertise. If we are really going to tackle these, you know, um, complex real life problems. Absolutely. Um, I have a question. I raised my hand because I have a question actually, and it comes. I mean, I'm taking us back to the technology uh, level, uh, um, and the question is actually, how fast is too fast? Uh, we've for many years now we've been talking about uh, you know exponential speed of development and technological uh, development. Uh, uh, what, and Katri just mentioned how the, the, about the disconnect between political change or, or policy change uh, versus what we can uh, we can accomplish in terms of of, of technologies. Uh, right now, we are at a point where knowledge, which is kind of even even on a on a uh, you know uh, earlier stage of the development. Uh, is is exploding exponentially, and we are getting uh, that explosion even further facilitated. So you know the next few years is go are going to be quite. Uh, we, we talk about you know it being exponential. Uh, so how fast is too fast in the end? And uh, does that Im influence? Uh, do you or do what's your feeling of whether it influences the trust that we have for? for um, uh, technology development as a, as a society and what we could do to nurture that trust towards levels where we do not get to a situation where public support of technology development is, is you know, uh, a, a kind of flipped around where we feel like, no, technology is bad. Technology is something that, that we should stop, absolutely. So uh, maybe maybe start off with the question, how what's what's too fast? Uh, what, what identify kind of in your opinion where, where what that would mean and then uh, follow up with what we could nurture to to to, to what we could do to nurture trust when well, you know, I start uh, so so I, I think uh, uh, this is an interesting question because I think there are two things kind of how fast things actually are happening and what kind of perception we have of it. So, so we have this kind of a, a perception that things are kind of a moving rapidly and so on. And I think this is a, a, a creates a lot of mental activity among people, but it might also lead to kind of a hasty uh, decision making. So we are not really looking at what these technologies might do, uh, what, what they turn out to be, uh, but we may make uh, hasty regulations and so on. And, 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 and I think that's one danger. So. So I think we should also kind of need remember that the perception, the hype 
behalf of the technology change, that's usually mostly a, a, a kind of a false. And, and, and a lot of technology that we are using are actually quite old, uh, and it's kind of continued with, with old stuff. And, and, we, and this is part of the story about path dependence, but also part of the kind of a, the, 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 the things might change at the superficial level, but also that that lot of our high. Think about, for example, the autonomous vehicles. They have been promising them for the last 15 years. And in a couple of years, all the taxis would be autonomous. And still we have only few way more gaps in San Francisco somewhere. So, 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 uh, uh, and, and of course that's kind of a understandable because that's the way they are selling <laughs> their products. But, 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 but I think we need also a reflection on how seriously take these changes. Uh, for example, now thinking about these last, last language models, uh, chat GDP and so on, people are anticipating this will change everything. But I, I'm not quite doubtful because we are not going to let them do medical advice for a very long time. And, and, and all other kind of important things, we cannot leave to these systems that are so easily manipulated that we don't know how they work and so on. So the impact might be actually quite, quite, quite superficial. But of course, long-term uh, effects are, are probably uh, important, but they are very hard to anticipate. For example, how, because now they are going to change how we are producing text. So, so now, that's far the difficulty with, at least for me, and with probably many authors has it's been to producing a text. But now we have these devices that can basically produce text, but what we need to get uh, uh, good at is to editing it and kind of checking it and so on. This has been kind of secondary thought uh, for most of us. So, so, so it's very difficult to anticipate what happens to kind of our intellectual lives because a lot of thinking has been writing. Uh, but but I think that to take form will take a very long time. So we shouldn't be kind of uh, captured by the kind of first impressions. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess my answer um, to that is more on the lines of, I mean, I, 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 I don't, want to comment too fast, too slow, what we perceive versus what's in, you know, real life. But in general, I think we could do with a little bit more reflection as we develop these technologies. Um, so in general, again, we can slow down a little bit. Uh, um, um, and, you know, as we develop, we also do reflect. I think that that that's really important. And this is not only about the risks that are associated with these technologies, but also about, you know, how these technologies can um, benefit uh, humanity world, the problems that we have. How do we actually prioritize the deployment opportunities that uh, come with these technologies? Because obviously, you know, you have one technology, but you can do multiple things with that technology. You can develop it in multiple directions and you know what are the priorities of uh, of today and etc so in general i am uh, i am definitely in pro for slowing down and reflecting alongside but collectively not kind of independently because when technology developers develop technology and then the commentators and reflectors reflecting separately you know it's again not a productive uh, collaborative space so how do we also bring together reflection and development, walk side by side in the dialogue with one another? Thank you very, very much. Uh, there's a, a question from Zeynep. Uh, what do you think of the mission-oriented innovation frameworks and approaches? Uh, plus, how should the role of VTT change or evolve in the future to take a stronger role for societal transformation and impact? Petri or Idil, who wants to <laughs> tackle this one? Okay, again, there's kind of ambiguity in the mission oriented, but uh, so, so uh, as, as I said, uh, uh, there's this way of thinking that if we put enough kind of effort on some specific thing that kind of creates additional value. So even if the goal is kind of a, in itself relatively uh, meaningless, like getting people in the moon, as a byproduct, it produces a lot of useful stuff. Uh, but I, I, I think 
uh, I think there's some point in that. So there's no point in kind of a trying to do everything at the same time. But then on the other hand, I think the mission should have, be somehow meaningful. So it shouldn't be just arbitrary thing that is just decided by some very vague uh, policy preparation policy at the EA level that now we have this mission of, of doing X at the European level or the same thing as uh, now we have the governmental discussion that uh, probably they are kind of uh, throwing around yellow notes where there are these ideas that should be the next project. And, and, and uh, that's not necessarily the, the, the good way. And so I think VTT should kind of uh, play a role in this debate. What would be the meaningful projects and how to kind of organize them? Think about uh, kind of a facilitation and an organization of these projects so that they are not only just VTT projects, but involve other other, uh, uh, other other participants, stakeholders, but also that the, 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 the missions are somehow crucial and meaningful and, 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 and in, uh, so somehow uh, go here with other other missions, other uh, institutions and the VTD is having. Well, um, I'm, I'm also a little bit unclear about what is meant by mission oriented innovation frameworks. Uh, are we to talking about, you know, is it the same thing as purpose? led innovation or purposeful innovation um but i understand that as uh, maybe you know innovation endeavors that have a um higher societal purpose uh than you know innovating solely innovating uh, in whatever way for the sake of inno innovating um and also uh, i guess i would not claim that i have an understanding of uh, the kind of the, the the role that VTT is currently playing, because I believe there are roles that uh, VTT is playing and not one role. But what I, I mean, I, I do see VTT as, you know, very technology oriented, um, technology development oriented. And of course, there are m many similar organizations uh, across uh, countries, across EU um, and I wonder if you know they could start to be a model just by creating actually embedding reflection mechanisms of reflection into technology development uh, kind of uh, projects. And um, uh, so that's one you know one way of I think bringing mission orientation related um, uh, dimension into technology development because I'm not envisioning that you know tomorrow we're going to wake up. And VTT is going to be, I don't know, uh, VSI, which is uh, Finland's social innovation uh, kind of um, entity. No, VTT is going to continue having a very technology oriented uh, mission. But um, I, I think it's really important that, I mean, it's, it's a very, very important, significant um, uh, organization for Finland. Uh, and, and I personally find as an outsider still, uh, Finland to be very uh, technologically optimistic. Well, uh, I mean, arguably like, um, you know, all the West, but there are variations uh, across, I think, you know, countries. Finland is very technology optimistic and also super engineering uh, oriented. Um, so I, I, I'm just wondering whether there's an opportunity for VTT to model this, you know, okay, we're developing technology, but we are also reflecting on uh, on the opportunities that come with it to address these larger, you know, systemic societal problems, and also the risks uh, associated with, um, you know, with, uh, uh, with, with these um, new technologies. That's one thing that I can think of at the moment. Thank you very much, Idil. Uh, excellent answer. Um, Maya, um, would you like to ask your questions or comments? Yeah, maybe. A, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe a reflection and and also going a little bit back, but also also building on what you have said. So uh, Shimon mentioned this building 
trust and and how I see the dialogue or or reflection what what you like have been have been mentioning play important roles there so so kind of bringing this um, understanding of technology um, understanding its opportunities but also its risks and and like carrying out this um, open dialogue and and as as uh, it'll proposed kind of PTT could could be the player who who then kind of reflects, discusses um, openly, kind of takes the opportunity on on um, being very engineering oriented, but but still kind of bringing the humanity in 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 engineering. So so kind of facilitating this dialogue. So so this is something that I I see that actually VTT could take take stronger role so um when thinking of of kind of impact and how how it it we used to at, at least used to describe it in our our project proposals was that we actually we needed to be very positive so think 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 of the positive things that that this uh, technology uh, development this research will will bring us um but rather i see uh building more trust would uh, or, or we could build more trust is is if we were like able to discuss also the the negative impacts more more openly so that wouldn't need to be a something like yeah your research has some negative um impact so so let's forget it and and focus on something else no but it's also also like things do have their their positive sides their negative sides and and also then i think the question is how how we can find the best possible or good enough solutions how we can maximize the impact while minimizing harm but probably we cannot let's say make anything that is fully fully positive or or completely like get rid of the harms but but it's it's all about balancing and and I would really appreciate at, at VTT but also in the society overall uh, having more open dialogue on on the positive mm -hmm. and negative impacts so so maybe my my reflection on on that and uh, thank you for for very nice keynotes and and very nice dialogue here thank you maya uh, petri and Edil, would you like to comment on this somehow or or, or should we move on uh, maybe i just kind of add uh, i agree and 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 then what we also need to can develop is is the is the kind of culture for for uh, 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 kind of critical discussion. So, so kind of observing kind of a tendency. You can see in the Twitter that that being critical is pointing out something idiotic someone has said. So, when you are criticizing, you are only criticizing idiotic thing, and and and, and we are kind of missing uh, the basic basic uh, uh, idea of criticism, which is going to at the root of things. So, it, it could be constructive, and it's kind of looking at uh, kind of a the source of the problems rather than just kind of pointing out and, and or making fun of each other and I, I think we should need spaces for that kind of a discussion where we can kind of uh, respectfully disagree also about things but also present critical discussions and then kind of uh, create space where we can think about whether these difficulties could be turned to some kind of opportunity to do something about them or, or uh, and so on so so I think this is a kind of a one of the institutional development tasks that we have is to kind of uh, cre uh, create and maintain this kind of spaces where it's kind of reasonable to discuss uh, both positive and critical things. Uh, too much of the discussion kind of turns out to kind of expressing views and uh, choosing sides rather than kind of uh, thinking things through. Edith? I, yeah, I was actually maybe kind of uh, tr triggered, stimulated by Maya's um, follow up of the previous question and then uh, made a mental loop there. And I, I was thinking, um, I guess, leading, uh, you know, change in society or anything, quite often 
people make the assumption that, you know, to lead something, you have to be loud, you have to be at the front and you have to be, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, branding yourself with all sorts of buzzwords so that you gain legitimacy as an entity. But sometimes leading, uh, you know, or at least t- not not leading. I don't think any single entity can or should, uh, for that matter, lead societal change. However, uh, I think leadership in a systemic change um, context could also be very quiet uh, and elegant, and just uh, you know keeping an eye on uh, on you know, for example, I think VTT can do. Um, a very good job of, you know, terminological accuracies, for example, because what is happening uh, now that worries me quite a lot is this kind of loading of society and business context and innovation context of, you know, one buzzword after the other. Uh, and, um, and you know, are we going to be a sustainable business or a regenerative business or a climate neutral business or a Z- net zero business? It's like, just a second, uh, you know, just a second. What is the basis here? What are the targets that we are actually talking about that we need to, you know, we're working with rather than kind of pushing these, um, these well, these concepts, all of which might have very, very, of course, uh, in-depth academic explanation, explanations, discussions, etc., that are associated with it. Um, but what I'm maybe trying to say is also another role that VTT or an organization like VTT, which is for me at the very, very sweet spot of, you know, hard research and then hard kind of innovation, uh, but also, uh, you know, research and policy. Uh, One thing VTT can do quietly uh, uh, as part of the, you know, uh, leadership uh, or modeling is to kind of, um, you know, watching how the discourse is evolving uh, and, and trying to, you know, maybe clarify confusions or not add to the confusions around concepts. And I, I don't think we need more concepts, uh, you know, to be thrown uh, um thrown onto the society, onto businesses, I think we really need to understand, you know, what are the targets? What's the uncertainty associated with what kind of targets we should go towards? um, And stop calling them, you know, all all sorts of different things. I think we think can also play a role in this, you know, in how we are, how you're writing reports, how you're doing your presentations, how you're talking about these with technology developers. So, um, yeah, and uh, another thought that's prompted by uh, Maya and uh, Zeynep's comments and questions. Thank you, Idil. Uh, Mario Rika, would you like to uh, continue with your question? It's a, sure, it's a, sure, sure. Yes, go ahead. I, uh, yeah. It was a, a continuation from Zeynep. Um, so I, m- I mentioned in the chat that at the deep end of this um, uh, Meadows leverage point was system goals. And I interpreted that as a story or a mission or that there is some kind of a vision, a goal that the society is trying to reach. Um, not, a, not, a, not a balance, but uh, an attempt <laughs> to balance. Um, and uh, and I was thinking that earlier this kind of a goal or a mission has been provided by ideologies, so that stuff for social scientists like religion or uh, globalization or or a uh, Marxist vision on um, whatever kind of vision that has been through the history. But uh, if if we now wish to achieve this kind of a planetary sustainability, uh, it looks to me that the scientists need to be guiding the story. We need to be providing like the guidelines and the life cycle assessment and numbers that what is um, w- what is possible. Um, but I don't see many scientists are weaving the stories or coming up with ideologies, uh, not even the normative ones. So, so um, just to have an idea, 
So if VTT wants to, or I as a VTT researcher want to like uh, come up with collaborations with other institutions, who would be, in your opinion, a legitimate and a trusted source for this kind of a larger story? So who, who, who might be uh, presenting uh, an institution that can come up with a credible goal for the future? What do you mean by credible goal for the future? I mean, the credible is, is the goal that is leading us to a sustainable future that is keeping us sort of a, on a right track. So so if we wanted to to uh, um, change, so in the meadows, uh, the the leverage points, if, if, if we want to change the system, we need to, the deepest goal the deepest point is to affect the goals of the system. So if, if the current system is unsustainable, the deepest point for, for effect is to target the goals of the current system. So we need something new instead. So, or at least we need to tweak the current story. So who would be a credible source? Uh, I mean, with credibility, I mean this trust that we have been talking about. So what, uh, what, it, what would be an institution that is trusted, that can create this kind of a story and a new goal. Um, well, I don't, I do not think that there is an institution that actually can tell a story uh, that is correct and, you know, uh, in, in terms of the change that needs to happen in the world. Um, uh, because essentially, I think um, there are multiple stories uh, of sustainable futures. Um, and I also think that, you know, the diversity of communities who are able to produce uh, these stories should also be entitled to live those stories. Uh, and do the interventions themselves that are going to help them to realize those stories. Um, so I'm I'm a little bit worried when I when I kind of hear about this, you know, the change being talked about as this monolithic entity with very clear boundaries uh, and also you know traceable, trackable, and also verifiable. We don't know what is sustainable. We really don't know. You know, we do not know how down the track everything that we are doing today, um, uh, evidence-based interventions included, uh, we don't know whether these are actually, you know, uh, going to help us to move towards a sustainable future or not. Um, and that's, that's why I think in the now experimenting small scale and learning from those experiments is really important while also keeping in mind that um, we are res responsible from our stories and our part of the story, uh, but there is not only one story about a legitimate sustainable future. Uh, so I also would like to keep that in mind uh, in my own work that, you know, there are plural, uh, plural sustainable desirable futures and um, I don't uh, think any anyone in society should be, you know, kind of top down uh, um, telling stories that should be adopted by other others in, in society. I also see this as a collective story making process. That's, certainly, I completely uh, agree with you because I'm a social scientist and, and this is, for instance, this is Finland where we, we can have six different parties in, a, in the same government and nobody thinks they own the truth. Uh, instead, it's a collaboration. Um, my intention was to ask as a VTT researcher what party could be telling a story that we can kind of uh, agree on together. Uh, and I, I see that our CEO is raising his head, so he probably can answer that better than you. But this was a conceptual question. This was a conceptual question that as a research, uh, scientific research institution, uh, what what would be like a, a story that we can participate in in the no, in the knowledge that there is going to be different 
uh, stories and nobody is more correct than the others. Well, sorry for women's planning you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you know, I'm taking that that mini lecture back um, humbly. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I guess um, maybe this is a question that you need to, you know, ask uh, internally and discuss. Kathy, would you like to f quickly follow up, or do we go for the last question? Maybe some, some things fall. So, okay. Uh, so, so you were discussing a bit ideologies, but I think uh, there's a kind of a challenge of developing positive ideas about the future. Nowadays, we are more and more uh, kind of uh, avoiding various dangers and, 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 and things in relation to AI with the climate change and so on. It's kind of through the negative. And, and then uh, I think uh, we need kind of a realistic technological visions where we can show, for example, how to use EAI in, in public uh, administration in order to reduce inequality rather than creating it. So, so thinking about how it should set up, we should have auditing, transparency and so on, and then kind of thinking about how the arrangements would work rather than just kind of talk about algorithms always being biased. Of course, humans are biased too, so we should kind of compare which is an improvement and how we sustain current achievements. But, but that requires kind of a positive uh, imagination and with the real materials and i think that would be kind of a role uh, 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 engineers and scientists could play kind of give people positive idea what kind of thing what, what these things would look like in the future but uh, so, so that it would be the future that we'd like to have thank you petri uh Ante, would you like to ask your question yeah and i i wasn't planning on mansplaining or CEOs planning any anything here, but the, I, I, um, this has been really ed educational and instructional in, in, a, in a way and also also very new new ground to cover. So in that sense, then that these types of things are definitely necessary because it's it's kind of like with a very in, in engineering business background like I have, then this is this is new, new area to um, to explore, but it, but in that sense, I, I I I don't really have a question. I I have more of wish that the especially Idil has been bringing up this that the VTT could could be taking a new type of role here and 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 sort of I I think that we need to explore that idea more. That what would it mean? And and I'm sure that there is the 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 full, full utopia that what it would mean and and kind of like today's situation and and even if we take a just a small step in the in some somewhat correctish direction it would be already already fairly radical thing so I I, I hope that uh, this is something that you use then ibex for that you 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 explore what that would mean and and it, also, kind of like from the comments coming from the people who are in, in the IBEX teams, I, I think that sounds like that there is at least some appetite for this type of thinking as well. So just a kind, kind wish. Thank you very much. Um, we have five minutes left. If there's a if there's a comment or question, uh, then we can go ahead with that. If not, then then we can of course uh, close this meeting. Any other comments or questions? Maybe Thomas, yes, you said you, 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 so, yeah. Uh, so so uh, uh, so science cannot tell us what what is good and what is beautiful, but the same goes for humanities. So mm. so uh, they don't have a special uh, special authority on on good and, and and beautiful either. But they might be more skillful in thinking about those things, and that's why they might be useful parties. So, so don't give them authority, but but uh, learn from them. Uh, so, so that that's my position as a philosopher. <laughs> uh, if I may, just uh, I don't know whether this is a track that anybody wanted to explore, but if we 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 have been talking about the influence of 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 um, a technology on our society the, uh, the, quite quite largely, and 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 the positive and negative effects. Uh, that it might bring and that's of course what we want to do it at, at, uh, what we want to understand also much more in 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 ibex uh, but there's also a lot of structures uh, systemic structures in place that are all that are flawed in their design that 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 inhibit or 
prohibit or restrict developments that are positive in, 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 in nature. So I think that it's also important for us to bear in mind that there's that, that, that we need to explore both sides uh, whenever we're talking about uh, a new positive uh, innovation in the future, that, 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 that there, are, there are systems in place that prohibit us from, from doing things. Uh, I mean, the grand gestures of open science and open innovation are, are lost because of the way we uh, protect IP and the, the, the way we generate revenue from our, our technological development. So it's uh, it's there, there there's many things that i think we need to be considered not just the technology influence but also the, the kind of the the structures aspect that that feeds back i don't know whether somebody wants to comment that but <laughs> okay uh thank you for a Great event, uh, uh, Auntie and uh, says, and uh, thank you especially to our wonderful speakers, Petri and Idil. It's been really mind opening, I hope, and uh, I really hope that we can continue having these discussions and dialogues in the future. And uh, I hope that you are now friends of the program and you will be much more involved in the future. And if somebody has questions that you would like to, I actually had some questions uh, prior to this event already for perhaps some sort of interaction with Petri and Idil. So please, I, 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 I would encourage you to maybe take contact with, with Petri and Idil when, when you feel it, it, it would be productive and valuable. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers and I wish you a lovely afternoon. Thank you.